From the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, it's Retro Nerd Girl with a film review for you. Today, I'll be reviewing the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, released in 1984. Starring Harrison Ford, Karen Allen, and Paul Freeman. Directed by Steven Spielberg. The synopsis is, the Ark of the Covenant is being actively pursued by Nazis in the 1930s. Professor Indiana Jones is assigned to intercept their acquisition and save the world from what they might do with such a power. The Story In his youth, it's well known that George Lucas was inspired by the 1930s space operas like Flash Gordon, as well as television shows like Captain Video and Rocky Jones. These were all televised in the 1950s and early 60s. Somewhere between then and the 1970s, he came up with the idea for two stories. A space opera that would eventually be called Star Wars and an action-adventure treasure hunter flick with the lead character, Indiana Smith. Indiana was the name of his then wife, Marcia Lucas's dog, who also inspired the creation of the iconic Star Wars character, Chewbacca. The naming of Indiana Smith was also influenced by the film Nevada Smith, released in 1966. The predecessors to this film and possibly influences from the genre include The Mummy, in 1932, She, 1935, The Mummy's Tomb, 1942, The Treasure of Sierra Madre, in 1948, Secret of the Incas, in 1954, The Mole People, in 1958, and The Pink Jungle, in 1968. George was also heavily influenced by the comic books Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge, written and drawn by Carl Barks. And that could also explain his fascination with anthropomorphic ducks, like Howard the Duck, which he directed in 1986. Within all of the influences I've mentioned, you can clearly see a little bit of Indiana in all of them. Sometime during the 1970s, George Lucas began working on the story with Philip Kaufman, most famous for directing Invasion of the Body Snatchers in 1978, The Right Stuff in 1983, and Quills in the year 2000. Philip Kaufman was set up to direct the film and added the wonderful idea to have the story's MacGuffin be the Ark of the Covenant. Kaufman left the project in order to direct the outlaw Josie Wales in 1976. After the production of Star Wars in 1977 was finished, George Lucas went to Hawaii to relieve some stress and was joined by his friend Steven Spielberg. While building a sandcastle together, Stephen told George that he always wanted to make a James Bond film. Imagine that for a moment. A James Bond film directed by Steven Spielberg. Oh my god. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Lucas then offered an alternative action-adventure project in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and so movie history was made. When they returned home, Stephen introduced George to Lawrence Kasdan, who was a rising screenwriter at the time. The initial treatment was handwritten by George Lucas with simple details such as Indiana Smith, a character who carried a bullwhip and wore a fedora hat. Stephen didn't like the name Smith for the main character, so it was changed to Jones. And that's probably a good and wise decision because it sounds too closely to the movie that inspired the name. 
Lucas originally wanted Indiana Jones to be more like James Bond, a ladies' man. And that is why perhaps he has a different love interest in each movie. However, the character is overpowered by the influence of Spielberg and Lawrence Kasdan, who pushed for Indiana to be more about the mission than being a womanizer. As well, another character trait that was subdued from the story was actually an idea that Steven Spielberg had, who imagined Jones as being an alcoholic. And that little detail seemed to have fallen away. As you can see, just a hint of it in one instance where Jones believes that his love interest, Marion, had died. In the story, Marion was to be a Nazi spy. And just imagining this is so very interesting. As the script became more defined, she became the daughter of Indy's mentor. And the idea was saved for Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, released in 1989. The three hashed out more details for the story and George enjoyed working with Kasdan so much that he hired him immediately to write the sequel to Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, in 1980. You would think that a project with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg collaborating together would get snatched up in Hollywood. But on the contrary, the film was rejected by every studio and only after a great deal of coaxing, Raiders got the green light from Paramount Pictures. The actual story is pretty straightforward. It's a linear story with a beginning, a middle, and an ending. But there aren't any deep nuances or messages for the audience to glean. There are some comedic moments in the film that are not jokes, but more appropriate humor naturally sprinkled for fun. It's really kind of stupid simple. It's not clunky and complicated. It just works because life is funny even when things aren't going perfectly. The pacing. At an hour and 55 minutes, this is the shortest Indiana Jones movie. And in my opinion, it works excellently without giving the audience adrenaline fatigue. The challenge. The challenge in this film are the Nazis of the 1930s seeking the Ark of the Covenant, hoping that it will give them a leg up on their world domination plan. They may also be looking to use it as a super weapon to destroy their enemies. Their key operatives are Colonel Dietrich and Commander Arnold Todd, who are looking for the headpiece of an ancient Egyptian artifact known as the Staff of Ra that will reveal to them the location of the Ark of the Covenant. Arnold Todd, in particular, is more like a torturous inquisitor that uses a heavy hand to unscrupulously get what he wants by the most brutal means possible. His name is is the German word for death, and he truly is terrifying. The character was based on Henrik Himmler, the real-life head of the SS in Nazi Germany, who was instrumental in the terrible crimes during the Holocaust. And just knowing that gives me chills. Indiana does have an arch enemy in the rival archaeologist René Belloc whose methods of acquiring antiquities is to have someone else do all the hard work for him and then stealing it from them, taking home the spoils. The film excellently demonstrates this in the opening scene where Indiana is in Peru to retrieve the golden fertility idol. Belloc to me is a very interesting villain because he isn't the most terrifying and he is susceptible to human emotions. The one that seems to rule him is greed and this is the reason why he's helping the Nazis. Uh, as well, the film implies that he 
has personal plans for the Ark of the Covenant. And you know what? Perhaps he pursues his greed in order to attain the finer things in life, such as good wine and women. He's a bit of a romantic in the way that he keeps trying to seduce and even sometimes protect Indy's girlfriend in the film, Marion. The film humanizes the character as a person who is just like a stone's throw away from being on the side of good. He just doesn't have a reason that's strong enough to change his perspective on life. Perhaps a villain like that is the most dangerous of all. They get close to you before they strike. Now the empathy. Although we don't know much about Indiana Jones in this film, the empathy for the character happens almost immediately because we see him go through so much in that wonderful opening action adventure scene in Peru. He's scared, he's worried, he's careful, he's double-crossed, he's chased. He just makes it and immediately we care about him. We identify with him and we want to know more about his character and his world. That scene is about the most backstory we get, mainly because it's just to set up his rivalry with Belloc and to tell us so much about the lengths to which Indy will go about acquiring rare artifacts. It's more of a character study than anything. His job is important to him and it's worth risking his life for. And that is his purpose for everything he does in the film. The audience can really understand him. It's not that anything he does is predictable. He can still surprise us. But again, we know that whatever he does, it's coming from a place we understand. This is where it's a strong connection to James Bond, a man sent out on complex missions that stops the bad guys from using the MacGuffin to gain power or control. Both characters are ruled by their high purpose, which governs every action they make. Indiana doesn't experience an arc during the film. There's a sense that this is just one adventure of his interesting life. I mentioned that Indy has a girlfriend in the film, Marion Ravenwood. She is the daughter of his deceased mentor, Abner Ravenwood, who had the headpiece of the Staff of Ra. The story goes that 10 years prior, when she was approximately 15, 16, or 17, he was 10 years older, and they had a love affair which broke her heart when he left. But you can see that they were setting up Marion to be a very hurt character that was abandoned by both her first love and eventually her father when he died and left her to fend for herself. The relationship that he has with Marion is very testy because Marion is just a little tougher than your typical damsel in distress. She fights back and she has an axe to grind with Indy. And I really love that feistiness in her. Indy's response to her is definitely a little dismissive. And I, I wonder sometimes in the film if he still just thinks of her as a child. It's a cute relationship and we get to care about what happens to Marion during the film. The technical aspects. The film technically really pushes the envelope creating an immersive roller coaster ride for the audience. It's filmed so viscerally real and practical that it holds up much better than so many other films of its time and it hardly feels dated at all. There are many scenes that are simply in their own level in this film and the beginning opening scene is one of those memorable scenes that that scene in particular was heavily borrowed from the comic books, Uncle Scrooge, the prize of Pizarro, and Uncle Scrooge, the seven cities of Cibola. The deserts of Tunisia was utilized for the scenes of Cairo, Egypt, which George Lucas filmed the Tatooine scenes in Star Wars. 
It was incredibly hot and most of the crew got sick from the food and water there, except for Steven Spielberg, who brought his own cans of SpaghettiOs. However, it motivated the speedy completion of the shoot in four and a half weeks instead of the intended six. Indiana Jones's trademark outfit is not original by any means. The weathered flying jacket and the dusty fedora hat was worn by Charlton Heston in the film Secret of the Incas, where he played a treasure hunter who uses a beam of sunlight in a map room exactly as Indy did. Now on the topic of Indy's look for the film, it was perfect for Indiana Jones, keeping in mind its practicality and necessity in the story. In fact, all of the costumes for the film were beautifully weathered and textured for the maximum realism that could be achieved at the time. Now there was one small incident of a time-traveling pedestrian walking through one of the scenes, but on the most part, they did do an excellent job. The Well of Souls sequence was one of my favorite scenes because what you don't know about me is that I love ancient Egyptian history and artifacts. So needless to say, I was paying close attention and fascination. The idea for the scene was going to be to use mechanical snakes. However, it would not have the same impact as real snakes would. So they set out to acquire real snakes from every pet shop in London and the south of England. They used legless lizards and even cut hoses to create a scary mass of them, terrifying snake phobics far and wide. The scene was a monster to pull off, but it has to be one of the most memorable moments in cinema with a little bonus. One of the pillars on the set had an engraving of R2-D2 and C-3PO from Star Wars depicted on it. This was the beginning of the infamous fan theory that Indiana Jones movies were just dreams that Han Solo was having while frozen in carbonite between The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi, released in 1983. I like that fan theory myself. It's quite interesting. Now the opening of the Ark was another memorable scene that was both mystical and graphic, garnering the film an initial R rating. Layers of fire in front of the image of an exploding head was all it took to tone down the gore and to get that sweet, sweet PG rating they were after. <laughs> In the modern age, I've heard many comments refer to the effects in this scene as cheesy and corny. But guys, you know what? In 1981, this was a true achievement of astronomical proportions. Steven Spielberg said that the melting head effect was the most impressive effect he had ever seen at the time. As well, the special effects makeup artist Chris Wallace got calls from fellow special effects artists and fans asking him how it was all done. What an ingenious effect. It's debatable whether it's held up over time, but I guess for me it has. It's still pretty incredible to watch. There are just so many epic level moments in the scene that it just really still just astounds me, even knowing how it was all done in detail. I just love it. Another extremely difficult and simply astounding scene was the truck sequence. Guys, that's... That sequence was amazing, uh, which took five difficult weeks to film. The scene was partially inspired by Yakima Knut's stunt in John Ford's Stagecoach, released in 1939. This scene is filled with incredible action, and believe it or not, 
emotion as our hopes rise and fall with Indy's losses and wins. This leaves a lasting impact on the audience and it's the secret to why a character we barely know becomes so beloved. This is the same with the plane lot scene when Indy has to fight a German mechanic played by famous henchman actor Pat Roach. There are so many technical elements being dispatched simultaneously to pull that scene off. But instead of confusing the audience, we root for our protagonists harder as they barely escape their dune. It's just so beautifully executed and the timing is not fatiguing. A big part of the Indiana Jones experience is the sound in the film, which was due to sound designer Ben Burtt's unique talent for seeking out audio pieces for specific moments. All of the hard work paid off, helping the audience to feel immersed in the world. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas films always seem to have outstanding music, which creates a hyper-realistic experience for the audience. The Raiders March, performed by the London Symphony Orchestra, composed by John Williams, was incredible and is synonymous with Indiana Jones and its franchise and is regarded as one of the most recognized pieces of music in cinema history. Performances A lot of actors were considered for the role of Indiana Jones. And no one got closer than Tom Selleck, who actually landed the part, but came into conflicts with his schedule while filming his TV show, Magnum P.I. There is much debate as to whether or not Tom could have pulled off the role. And to me, the answer is absolutely. <laughs> Magnum P.I. was on the air from 1980 to 1988 as a testament to his ability to tell a story for an audience. Tom Selleck has even had a bit of fun when he parodied his miss at the role in an episode called Magnum P.I. The Legend of the Lost Ark in 1988. Mind you, that episode was done for laughs and not how he actually planned to play the part. Harrison Ford was who Steven Spielberg wanted to play the part from the beginning. However, George Lucas didn't want Ford to become limited by a reputation for only working with one filmmaker since he was in three of Lucas's prior films, American Graffiti in 1973, Star Wars in 1977, and Star Wars Empire Strikes Back in 1980. Harrison Ford loved the script and was signed up for three movies just less than three weeks before principal photography began. Harrison Ford had wonderful body doubles for his stunts, but also did a lot of the physical stunt work himself. And you can actually see him performing it in the movie. And that really helps to sell the believability. Just his acting alone, every single wince, every single punch is felt with not only the sacrifice for the production, but his talent as an actor. He really knows how to sell, you know, those punches and those winces and those moments of pure uh, pain to the audience. And, you know, he does play in the a lot like Han Solo with a casual swagger. However, there is a big difference between the two characters because Indy is a character with a purpose to help humanity, whereas Han is out for himself. There's also a bit of levity in the character that he inserts, such as his suggestion to simply shoot a character rather than to engage in a long sword fight and we all know the wonderful scene uh, and this stemmed from the real life issue of being sick in Tunisia as most of the cast was 
it's his kind of charm that makes the, the character of Indiana Jones so likable and so believable. Karen Allen was selected to play Marion after Steven Spielberg saw her in National Lampoon's Animal House in 1978. She plays the role with a hint of innocence and spice. And it's really interesting because she improvised a large chunk of her scenes, providing more callbacks and reasoning for her character's presence in the film that wasn't actually written for her. So I, I thought that was very, very uh, clever for her to really put her point of view of what she thought her character was in the film. And um, just as a cute little note, uh, this was Alfred Molina's first credited screen role. And on his first day of filming, he was covered with real life tarantulas. Okay. Oh my goodness. My God. Welcome to showbiz on your first day of, <laughs> of working in Hollywood. <laughs> Thank goodness that didn't scare him away from being an actor. <laughs> Now my enjoyment. First of all, let's talk about the fantastic poster illustrated by Richard Amsel. Wow. You know, combined with an amazing trailer in 1981, audiences were rushing to see this film and they weren't disappointed as it was full of action and adventure and a fantastic high quality production for the time. Raiders of the Lost Ark was 1981's top grossing film and it won five Academy Awards. It was recognized and nominated for eight in total. It is among the American Film Institute's 1998 list of the top 100 greatest American movies and it was added to the U.S. Library of Congress National Film Registry as culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Many people have critiqued the film and have said that Indiana Jones is a weak character because he doesn't affect the final result in the film. And to that statement, I don't agree with. <laughs> Okay, first of all, the Nazis only learn about the location of the headpiece because they follow Indiana Jones. He's the catalyst for everything that happens in the film. He saves Marion twice, okay, once at her bar, because I, I believe that the Nazis were going to kill her after they tortured her for the headpiece. Um, but it, let's say they didn't. He also saves her again on the mountaintop when he told her to close her eyes when the ark was opened. He also brings the ark to the U.S. government for quote unquote safe keeping. <laughs> you know, without Jones, it would pretty much be up for grabs for anyone who stumbled upon it. And it actually also saved the lives of those people that may have stumbled on it and opened it without knowing that it was a problem. By the end of the film, there's a sense that the Ark is safe for now. Even though Indiana Jones is not responsible for dispatching the bad guys, and he is never really the one who does it in any of the films. I say that that might actually be the most realistic part of the film. Indy isn't a superhero. He's actually a man, a physical man, and he's allowed to fail and grow. The story serves its purpose by telling us a harrowing situation that he survived. And this is only one experience in a lifetime of adventure. And I think that's cool. We don't have a lot of movies where you have these kind of adventures that keep going on and on and on. And we should. I think we absolutely should have more adventure movies and not always say that it's ripping off Indiana Jones because they certainly, this movie, as I've proved from the, my entire review, is that it is actually a conglomeration of so many different movies in history, in cinema, and comic books, and it, it was just something that 
kind of came together a lightning in a bottle if you will with some of the greatest filmmakers of our time i mean what movie has like seven amazing moments that you just can't shut up about after you see them it's a brilliantly choreographed visceral action adventure spectacle designed to thrill audiences of all ages it's impossible not to rank it high on the list of the all-time movie greats my rating is a 9.9 .9. well that sums up my review i hoped you liked it this is retro nerd girl signing off Take care, movie lovers. I'm off to my next review.